Let me ask you a question. How many of you have not been to Ikea? <laughs> Nobody's put up their hands, so that's good, because I think most of us have been to Ikea. It's a good place to pick up some, well, at least I think, pretty cool Swedish designs for furniture, things for your home. And one thing I like about that store is that you know, they s display everything, like everything that they make in a little bedroom or an office space, they have kitchens there, and it shows you what it's like. What it, it, it's Ikea dreamland, right? And so you can see what it looks like. And when you see it, it inspires you to think a little bit broader perhaps, how you can change your bedroom, how you can change your kitchen, your office, any space in your house. Unfortunately, it looks better in their showroom than in your house, unless your house is all full of IKEA stuff. But once you figure out their floor plan, because I always get lost, I like to take the shortcuts, but I always get lost. But once you decide on what you want, then you head downstairs and you go look for your flat pack box, aisle 10, bin three. And you're all excited to get home and then when you unload your car, you take it inside to your place, you open the box, you unpackage it, reality strikes, assembly required. You glare at those pieces strewn all over your living room floor and you realize it takes effort, it takes commitment, it takes perseverance to put it all together and, and many times it takes help. You need someone else to come along, maybe even two or three to put that thing together. And it's sometimes it's like church. If we are to look like what Christ designed us to be, and in order to be what glorifies him, each one of you have to affirm those two words, assembly required. And for the sake of Christ our Lord and Savior, we want to be like that beautiful Ikea furniture in that showroom. As Christ's church, we want to showcase all his glories that he designed for us, each one of you. In the coming weeks, I'll be preaching sermons that will build upon what uh, Pastor Tommy has been teaching us in the book of Acts. They'll draw from other areas of the New Testament in order to give us a, a broader and deeper understanding of church. It's very relevant for us and will be helpful for us at Oak Ridge to think through what the scripture calls each one of us to as faithful Christ-centered followers. In Acts, we've already witnessed the birth and growth of the church, and we have to apply. We have to apply what we are learning in our lives and the life of the local church. And perhaps this topic is even more relevant for us as we, quote-unquote, restart church and regain our footing. As a note, this topical sermon is in part based upon Kent Hughes' classic book on spiritual disciplines. And so this morning as we unfold God's word together, this is what we want to walk away with. This is the take-home point, that God will challenge us to a deeper understanding and commitment in the spiritual discipline of church. Yes, this box is clear with our, our first applicational point. And number one, uh, sorry, I have to figure out how this works. Maybe you can advance it upstairs. But anyway, let's go back to old-fashioned way, writing, if you write notes. Number one. When you understand what is church and some realities we face, you will know that your assembly is required here at OBC. When you understand what is church and some realities that we face, you will know that your assembly is required here at OBC. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. So I'm really maybe really addressing those who are watching online. 
As we begin, we can ask, what is church? And refresh our memories. The Greek word for church is defined as, quote, people called out from the world and to God, the outcome being the church. Thayer's lexicon has an interesting entry for the word church, which should cause us to think, quote, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly, end quote. And so to make that entry relevant to us today, we could perhaps paraphrase it and state this, quote, a gathering of Christians called to get off YouTube or Zoom church and back assembled here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church. It's been stated many times by many people that the church is people. That is a reality. God's people. It's not just, it's not a building. The building is a tool for us to gather in. I do want to note that as we go through this sermon, we do understand that for some of you, especially for those of you at home, some of you have health reasons to be at home and to, to use this live stream as, as a ministry tool. That's what we're doing. And then there are some at home or perhaps you're struggling. Fear is a big thing right now. Maybe you're struggling with fear. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's, often we call it, idols of the heart that need to be dismantled. And we understand that, and we encourage you to reach out to one of the leaders of the church, and we'd love to come alongside you and help you through that. That's what the church is about. And so... If we are concerned about Jesus, then we are to be concerned about church, his church, ordained through his incarnation, sinless life and ministry, death on the cross for our sins, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, his ascension, his sending of the Holy Spirit. The church belongs to him. We, the church, or we, the people, are under his sole authority. And so assembling together is important to you. Yet we see a growing alienation of the church, and we are certainly seeing this almost in all churches coming out of this pandemic. And here is a recent headline. A news article this summer was titled, quote, Millions Skip Church During Pandemic, Will They Return? And in that article, it highlighted uh, at least one church uh, that had to shut its doors down. Of course, there were probably uh, underlying problems already before that, but they had to shut down. And it's a sobering reality if we understand the times. And there are also as other aspects that we can look at. For example, the self-professing Christian but does not attend church nor wants any serious connection to a local church. Well, you know Christians who are quote-unquote church hoppers with a consumeristic food court, fast food, secular approach to church. My food, my choice, my way, my time, make it quick, make it delicious, make it my way. And that's how they see church. And these persons will attend one church for the preaching, another for a growth group, and another for emotional buzz with the top ten charts, worship team, in order to fulfill their felt needs. Their felt needs. Because it's driven by self. And not their real needs, the biblical needs. And so they will float from church to church to tailor a menu they desire, my church, my way, a church in this image of self. They're not committed, nor biblically accountable. They lack discipline. They devalue biblical discipleship and have no roots in the local church. They exist in a, a nebulous spirituality, adrift from biblical ordinances and scriptural parameters and a working knowledge of what church is. Yet here is the testimony and pattern of early New Testament Christians as we've already studied in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I'll just read verse 42. Acts 2, 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
And so it reveals to us a God-glorifying pattern for us to follow. So let's retrace why this church was the way it was. Under Christ's submitted leadership, the early church was attractive, it was healthy, it was captivating to the saved and the unsaved. And we see that Christians identified themselves as the church. This was a church full of the born again, marked by genuine saving faith, shown by their unwavering devotion to the Lord through one another. They carried out all the biblical one another's that we read in the New Testament. Everyone had a present and active role in the church. It was also a church that was committed to being together and being equipped to accomplish the will of God. It was an effective, Christ-glorifying church because at the heart of this church was our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And this was a contagious church, a joy-filled place, infecting others with the selfless love rooted in Christ. And so the result was that the church grew numerically and spiritually through the testimony of the gospel lived out daily. So we learn from Acts chapter 2 that physical assembly is required in the local church, and they excelled at it. And that is our goal, too, to excel at assembling together. Let's take a moment to reflect, and I want you to ask yourself this question. What needs to change in my life or your life, in your attitudes, in your actions, so that you are more Christ-centered in this church at OBC, so that we can continue to be like the Acts 2 church. Now let's move on to develop our second applicational point for you to think about and move into practice. Number two, your assembly is required because you have a purpose, goal, and relationship with one another and Jesus at OBC. Now let's just take a quick look at Ephesians 5, 23 to 30. It gives us a big picture of the dynamic and the, the radiance of the church. And Ephesians 5, 23 to verse 30 says this, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. In this passage, we find those who are born again, who are the church, are the bride. And Jesus Christ is the head. And so we have the church and we have Christ. That is the relationship that we have. That is what the scripture tells us. And implicit in this passage is the link to the spiritual disciplines that will cause believers to be spiritually mature. And so spiritual maturity is the purpose of the church. That includes the blessings of being under Christ's authority, and submission and obedience, love, sacrifice, discipleship, mutual edification. Christ has died to save us so that each of us be found holy. And holiness is our goal. And therefore, the out there, the 
the lone Christian, the individualistic lifestyle of a so-called Christian who is on his or her own, the give me Jesus only, and who cares about church because it's so difficult, that thinking will be demolished. And the biblical doctrine of church is upheld. Augustine commented, commented that, quote, the deserter of the church cannot be in Christ since he is not among church Christ's members, end quote. John Calvin in his commentary on Ephesians states this, quote, the church is the common mother of all the godly, which bears, nourishes, and governs in the Lord both kings and commoners, and this is done by the ministry. Those who neglect or despise this order want to be wiser than Christ. Woe to their pride, end quote. So this is serious food for thought from the history of the early church fathers, and especially among the undeniable testimony of the scripture. It should really challenge us and, and shape our, our views and, and commitment to Christ's church as expressed in the local church. And so, to make this applicable, something to carry out an action for this week, perhaps, is so will you encourage someone in this church who's not here, encourage one another in the spiritual discipline of church and to the committed membership to the local church because assembly is required. As we continue on our look at the spiritual discipline of church, this now leads us to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24, and we'll discover that number three, when you commit yourself to assemble together, you can experience God's many blessings. So I invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to spend a, the most time in this section of Scripture this morning. This will be an exposition of these verses, Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And through this passage, Hebrews 12, starting at 22, we will find seven experiences. There are seven experiences or blessings in a corporate gathering coming before God. So Hebrews 12, starting at verse 22, says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of God. Abel. The writer of Hebrews uses the Old Testament imagery of the people of Israel assembling together before God at Mount Sinai in the immediate context of verses 18 to 21. Really, he's looking at Exodus 19 and 20. Because it was there that the people of Israel received the Mosaic law, which no one could perfectly keep. And then this con is contrasted to Mount Zion, being the place of blessing of the gospel where people can come to God through saving faith in Jesus Christ alone. He is the perfect law keeper for the forgiveness of their sins. And the Hebrew Christians were not to scatter from God in the face of difficulties, but they were to persevere, to run to the, the race of faith. That's at the beginning of chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. To serve the living God, to renew their spiritual resolve in Christ, let they, lest they receive God's discipline. And therefore, our passage reveals this first. And we see that in verse 22a. First, we get a taste of our heavenly hope. That is the first blessing, our heavenly hope, a taste of it. Our verse describes the Hebrews, and likewise our heavenly hope is Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. Mount Zion was a place that David brought the, the Ark of the Covenant to. Solomon built the temple there because God chose Jerusalem, or Zion, as his dwelling place. 
In our earthly life in Christ, we have a foretaste uh, through our earthly counterpart of the heavenly Jerusalem. As Christians, we are, as it says in Ephesians 2, 6, raised up with him, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And therefore, we have our citizenship in the heavenly Jerusalem, and enjoy some of the blessings now. And in the future, we will dwell in the city of the living God and enjoy it forever when we leave this earthly place. Second, we see in the second half of verse 22, as a church, we have the privilege of being among God's heavenly beings. We have the privilege of being among God's heavenly beings. You know, I, even myself, except going through this sermon and this morning, kind of thinking through it as I was sitting at the back there, usually we don't think in these terms when we come to church, but we find the reality here at the end of Hebrews, verse 22, stating that there are innumerable angels in festal gathering. So when we assemble before God, we have come, as this text states, among a spectacular amount of angels. And that word innumerable literally is 10,000. And they are serving, they are rejoicing, they are celebrating, they are worshiping as we worship God. Angels are involved with our lives. Hebrews 1 verse 14 states this. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The third blessing we receive from the spiritual discipline of church is that we are all heirs of Christ, verse 23 at the beginning. In Christ we are the assembly, and we belong under the rightful headship of the firstborn or the preeminent one who is Jesus Christ. And because of this, we, the church, have all the rights of inheritance, as Romans 8, 16, and 17 states, that we are, quote, God's children, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. And so, as co-heirs, the church of the firstborn is more than just a Christian flash mob. It's not just a bunch of Christians coming together but it is the outworking of the blessing of sharing membership together, sharing struggles together, praying for one another, all the blessings of the body of Christ coming together. And furthermore, as co-heirs with Christ, our names are enrolled in heaven. We are found to be in the Lamb's book, in the Lamb's book of life. So that's an immense blessing that we have even this morning as we sit here. Next, we find as we are assembled before God an undeserved favor. Our Heavenly Father is God the judge of all people. We are now in the presence of the awesome and holy one, without fear because we, are, we were once under his fierce wrath, Yet in Christ we do not find wrath, but his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, and salvation for those who trust in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. We're shown his love. And so when we practice the spiritual discipline of church, we delight in the gathering of the born again in the presence of God and in his great love. The fifth blessing that we have, we find in the second half, or the last half of, or last part of verse 23, we come to the triumphant saved, experiencing perfect righteousness under Christ. As the assembly of God, we are in good company. It says in this verse, it says, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And this phrase refers to the Old Testament saints. They could only look way into the, the fuzzy future to the coming Messiah. And now their life in Jesus is clear as it is to us. When we are in Christ, 
and ushered into our heavenly hope, we will be with all the great saints of the faith, like Noah, like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Rahab, Ruth, Elijah. Imagine that. And more, all the Old Testament saints, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Because of Christ's imputed righteousness, we share the same eternal, in, inexhaustible joys in the presence of our God when we come together. We can reflect that to one another as we look at each other in the eye, in person. The next, together as a church, we are in the ever-present beauty of Christ who stands between us and God the Father. We see that in verse 24. Through Jesus, we can stand, stand righteous before a holy God because Jesus is the mediator, as it says in this passage. He is the go-between. He is our defense attorney who also redeems us, the only one, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5. And because of this, we have received a new covenant, and the new covenant can be found in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34. It says, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Through the indwelling of Christ within us, who are born again, he forgives us all our sins. We have become a new creation in him, new creatures in him. Instead of a dead heart of stone that we had, rebellers against God, Christ regenerates us with a responsive heart towards God's things. There is no other mediator. There is no one in this world apart from Jesus Christ who can save us. He has removed the wrath of God because without Christ we are eternally condemned to hell because of our sins. And yet we have this wonderful, beautiful Savior, our mediator, who stands before God for us. And we rejoice in that when we meet together Finally, when the local church is committed to gathering together, we can rejoice in unison because of our redemption in Christ. We find Abel. In this passage, Abel is mentioned. We find Abel back in the Old Testament in Genesis 4. After Cain killed his brother Abel, the Lord came, Genesis 4, 9 to 10. Cain was angry that his offering was not acceptable to the Lord. And as a result, what did he do? He killed Abel. Abel. Abel, according to Hebrews 11.4, offered a better sacrifice on the basis of faith and obedience, which was pleasing to God. And though Abel, as it says also in Hebrews 4, obtained the testimony that he was righteous, Abel's blood speaks out. It speaks out of injustice. It speaks out of jealousy. It speaks of hatred. It speaks of murder, condemnation, of judgment. And the beauty of this passage is here, as we look at this verse, verse 24, that we have this great comparison. It says the sprinkled blood, the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ was far superior to Abel's sacrifice. As it says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. That Christ's sprinkled blood lavishly cried out the gospel, bringing forth the surpassing greatness of his substitutional, penal substitutionary atonement that Christ died in your place upon that cross. And therefore, we have been granted faith, grace, 
mercy, peace, eternal rest. That is what we gather together for, to celebrate, to worship God for all those mercies that he has shown us. Abel's blood had no atoning power for anything, for anyone. And therefore, Jesus Christ's sprinkled blood speaks a better word. For it is radiantly sufficient to, to cleanse all our sins, making peace with God for us who trust in Christ alone. So if these seven realities from Hebrews 12, 22 to 24 pictures the blessing that is experienced through the spiritual discipline of church in the church age and right now, the pastor says, you have come. You have come. We have come to this. You know, shouldn't we desire this immense reality of regularly as a normative pattern of one who is born again to, to desperately long to come together to worship our glorious Christ. That's what our hearts should long for. That's why we join together. That's why we come on the Lord's day to church. And so once again, Assembly is required. There's no other option for us who are truly in Christ and are truly faithful. The author that I mentioned of that book, Kent Hughes, writes in this book, quote, the dazzling images of the church assault us again and again in the New Testament in an effort to raise our thinking to the proper height. As a church, actually, we are Christ's body. He is the head. As members of his body, we have, at the same time, a profound unity, diversity, and mutuality. We are a temple. He is the cornerstone, and we are living stones, forming a living place of worship. We are the bride, and Christ, our groom, loves us with a holy love, which will bring us to the marriage feast of the Lamb. We are his sheep, and he is the nurturing shepherd. He is the vine, and we are the branches. We are organically in him, drawing all our sustenance for life from him, end quote. And so what we have looked at so far should help us to reaffirm in our hearts that by God's grace we have been granted an immense privilege to be the magnificent church, the most glorious community that this world will ever see because it is bought by Christ. We have been bought by Christ. And therefore, let us possess an undying passion about church and recognize that we as Christians need the church. Last but not least, number four. When your priority is to assemble together, you are faithfully doing God's will. The scripture calls us into fellowship within the context of church, and the single most pointed text is also from Hebrews, and now in chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, and we read that earlier this morning. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 states this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For the Christian, our response to the saving grace of the gospel in part is rooted in loving fellowship as it relates to the spiritual discipline of church. There is no other place other than the church that the things of God are found in his word can be properly expressed and fostered. When we come together, that's what we're doing. We hear his word, we can pray for one another. All those things that we see in the scripture come together when we gather together. The one and others. In this context of Hebrews, the Hebrews were in danger of falling back to the ways of Judaism in order to avert any persecution as the church. And likewise, we can have the temptation to fall away, but we should realize that the church is where the people of Jesus hang out as a local family, as Hebrews says, to stir up one another. 
to stir up one another to love and good works. And so it is here in the church by meeting together, our coming together for the purpose that we love and serve, and that we also are loved and served. In this place, we, the people, the church, is also the earthly place of hope. The author of Hebrews warns you. He warns you to guard yourself against the habit of some who are continuously neglecting to meet together. And there were some Christians who thought that fellowshipping was not important, so neglected assembling together, maybe work and a fatter paycheck on a Sunday was more important. Maybe hanging out with friends uh, took precedence. Maybe homework assignments and good grades were the priority. Those are good things, yet they can become idols of the heart. And so we might pause and ask, if God informs us that there is a real, a very real possibility that we could be drawn away from the fellowship because of life's distractions, The question is, what safeguards, what biblical safeguards are you putting in place in your life to avoid this ungodly habit, which is actually a rebuffing of all that Christ has provided for us in his salvation? One practical way is to recognize what our spiritual privileges are, as we've outlined many this morning. If, we're, if we understand that meeting together with like-minded believers is important to our identity in Christ, then as we set up appointments, maybe get an Instagram message saying, hey, let's meet on Sunday morning, 9.30. Let's go hang out. Let's go to the park. Maybe when we plan out our entertainment, our, that we put our assembling together into our schedule first as a non-negotiable no rescheduling no if you like to use pen and paper don't use the eraser erase that out and fill it up with something else tell your boss no i can't work on sunday morning i I go to church what a witness that would be too right to say let him know you're a christian open the door for the gospel And so you begin to develop the habit of saying no to anything that would take you away from fellowship, and especially corporate worship. We want to be faithful in doing God's will. And assembly is required. Work, school, is not the goal. Worship is. Worship is eternal. The end of verse 25 supplies us with the godly motivation to conform us to our spiritual priority, namely, as it says, as you see the day drawing near. This is a reference to the coming of the Lord. In other words, these are not the days for our lives to be unguarded. As we live in the end times, Christ has come. We are in the last days. And so be ready by faithfully doing God's will. Come to church, come to fellowship, gather together. Perhaps so ready that when Christ returns, maybe we'll be in this church building, fellowshipping at that very moment. As 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And therefore, may we together at OBC excel at fostering and focusing our affection, gearing our hearts' devotion to Christ, and desire that sweet fellowship with our brothers and sisters here this morning. Come, come back, meet together. It's good for you, you need it.
As we close, knowing the spiritual discipline, a church should help you to understand how much we need the church. So we must, with this deep commitment before Christ, support the church, which is people, you and me. Why? Because the church belongs to Christ. He died so that the church might be born and be alive. He died for you if you were born again. And it is through Christ's assembled church that you owe the shaping of your life, your character, your worldview, your calling, your vision, peace, hope, joy, love, all things for life and godliness. And it is in the assembled church that we are elevated in corporate worship, our our souls fed, so our hearts are, are burning within us by the cherished word preached. Our hearts knit before God in humble prayer. You are refreshed by the fellowship of the saints. We come in remembrance together as his church, as the local church, in remembrance and celebration of the Lord's Supper, transformed by discipleship, which takes place through the church, through the mature saints, for the younger believers. And you gain a growing passion for the lost through the carrying out of the Great Commission, making disciples. And so as we work out the spiritual discipline at church, it will call you to be disciplined. Disciplined in regular commitment and attendance, unshakable in regular covenant before God, Submitted to Christ through formal church membership, faithful in financial stewardship through giving to the Lord, and generous in who in wholehearted participation, using what the Lord has given to you as his steward. Time, natural abilities, resources, and spiritual gifts all being poured out into this local part of Christ's church as an offering to him. And as we do that more and more, then we will become the Acts chapter 2 church that we've been learning about. That's where we're going. So come, come together, commit yourself so that Christ would be fully glorified through you, his church, all of us fully assembled in him, serving as we await his certain return. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful for your word. It is indeed like a double-edged sword. And as we are faithful hearers, it will convict us and cause us to repent. It will give us refreshing of our souls away from the things that we think we need towards the very things of God. Lord, we're so thankful that we are able to meet together because it is so important for our spiritual health. Lord, we pray for one another. We pray for those who might be struggling. And Lord, that you would meet them and through your spirit, stir their hearts to come before your throne of grace for strengthening, for mercy and compassion. Lord, we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, have an even stronger bond than our blood relationships who are not in Christ. That's how much we are and are to be as a family in Christ. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to be faithful for these things that we've learned this morning. We pray in the name of our risen Savior, the head of this church, Jesus Christ, for his glory. Amen.